Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we've got this brave new world of webinars, and I'll do the best I can. Um, I have some slides, and I'm going to run through a few concepts, and then we'll we'll take a few pictures. Uh, I take a few a question. Sorry, not pictures. Um, the um, I'm looking right at you through the camera there, but I do have a couple of other screens up, so I might look away from you. So the question on, on the agenda today is bunions, what are my options? How do we approach them? How do we think about them? And when is it appropriate for a patient to think I'm ready to address something surgical? How can it be dealt with non-surgically? So I'll give you my concepts. I think most orthopedic surgeons agree on basic principles, there may be some slight differences in techniques between one surgeon and another. So when I see a patient uh, who is ready to do something surgical, um, that would be a patient who's tried wide shoes, has tried maybe some arch supports, who's padded, uh, usually her foot, because they're more women than men. Um, and they're kind of fed up with uh, their bunions and maybe some other issues. Uh, what are we trying to do? I'm trying to do several things. I want to fix everything that I can at the same time. So if there's a bunion, hematone, neuroma, that sort of thing, those, they should all be corrected at the same time. We really want a pain-free foot. That's goal number one for me. There's not much point in having a nice straight foot if it hurts. Um, for many people, many patients, Fitting into a shoe comfortably uh, and is important, and we there are variations in um, what kind of shoes one can reasonably expect to get into. But basically, fit into a normal shoe uh, without too much fuss. Able to exercise for people who love to exercise, and the specifics are important. And the foot should look good. Usually, if the foot looks good to the patient, it is good because. Um, there's some cosmetic component to it, of course, but if the foot looks straight and it usually feels good as well. So what I, I, I probably have five or six different ways of handling 95% of the bunions that come across uh, uh, my screen or come into my office. And what I wanted to show you is not all bunions are the same. So if you look at the screen in front of you, we always look as surgeons, we always look at feet um, standing. We want to, and so if you look at the x-ray, it says upright because the patient was asked to stand. And that tells us what the bones are doing. So if you look at the patient's right foot, it's got the R symbol. That's sort of a mildish bunion. This one's a little bit more severe. You can see uh, that this, let me just go back one, sorry. So what we're looking at is the angle between these two bones. This is a little bit bigger. This is the bunion over here. So when you're looking down at your foot, that's the bunion there. This one's a little bit worse. You can see that the angle between these two bones is much bigger. And here's a real doozy where you can see that the proximal phalanx, which is where you think of your toe, is almost falling off the edge of that bone. So I'm just going to go back to that for a second. So if you look at the first x-ray, this bone and this bone are a little divergent, meaning they form a little bit of a V. And as we move through the slides, that angle and divergence, the V gets a little bit worse and worse and worser, as they would say. So it would be foolhardy to think that you could address all those problems in one way, because that's just not gonna happen. So when I look at the foot, I'm trying to think about what's the best solution for this particular patient. There may, may be more than one solution, um, but what's the best solution for an individual patient? And we gotta talk about it. I gotta find out what you like to do, what sort of sports, what kind of shoes you wanna wear, how big a heel, that sort of thing. This is the last one that uh, I should have showed you, which shows this is a bunion over here. You can see that the angle between these two bones is not too bad, 
But if you look at this joint, you can see the nice space over there, but you can see the lack of space there. So this isn't technically a bunion, it's more of an arthritic big toe. And so that has to be approached differently. And you can see this is the side view of that same patient with a big spur sitting on the top. So the approach needs to be individualized. We wanna know, you know how old age is sort of relative, but the approach for a 16 year old is different maybe than a 50 year old and different than an 80 year old. I wanna know the patient's overall health. Um, is it worth going through the recovery? Um, and uh, what can you expect in terms of having to be off the foot, that sort of thing. We want to set expectations clearly. Um, my standard line to patients is, I'd love to get, you know, if we're flying to California, or I'd love to get you there in one hour. But as we all know, that's simply not possible. So I think it's very important to set expectations when you talk to patients preoperatively and let them know what can be reasonably expected sort of each step along the way, what you can expect at one week, four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. And I actually have a form I fill out for patients and individualize it, trying to give uh, people an idea of exactly what you can and cannot expect. And also the information when you're sitting and talking with me, it's, it's a lot of information. So it's good to have uh, something that you can go back to and reference. And then what are your shoe wear needs, obviously. So again, our goals are clear. We want a pain-free foot, number one. It should fit into a shoe comfortably. And these aren't um, things I made up. These are, this is information garnered from studies with patients knowing, trying to understand what the, what the average person wants, able to exercise, and of course the foot should look good. So, I'm going to give you some examples of four or five different approaches to the problem. So you saw this x-ray a little earlier or a version of it. And again, if we look, this patient doesn't have that big a bunion, but some patients have pretty ugly looking foot and no pain and other patients have a milder foot and more pain. So the pain, pain is the primary driving force, I think, for people getting the foot fixed. Um, so when you look at this x-ray, this bone is a little divergent, again, a little bit of a V, but not too bad. So this I will, I will proceed with what's called a distal chevron Aiken procedure. Now, just to back up, the anesthetic for most patients is the following. My anesthesiologists will give you a little sedation and then they numb you up behind your knee. The nerve behind your knee um, called the tibial nerve, can be seen under ultrasound, and the anesthesiologist can be very accurate in placing some Novocaine or a long-acting Novocaine called Bupivacaine that numbs up the leg. Uh, you're not asleep at that point, we sort of, you, but you get enough uh, sedation so you don't care that someone's numbing you up, and then we let it sit in, and then 30, 40 minutes later, we go into the OR, and then you get enough sedation that you don't care, sort of a colonoscopy type level of anesthesia for those of you who've had that. And then you go to the recovery room for about an hour and head home. The beauty about the blocks is that they last about uh, 20 to 30 hours. So for the first day, you're absolutely pain-free. The second day uh, would be a painful day. Um, and we have multimodal management techniques, meaning you take Tylenol, Advil, and some narcotics if you need it. Probably half patients, half of my patients need a narcotic, half of the patients, it's nice to know you have it there, but uh, you don't end up having actually, actually having to take it. So you get your anesthetic, and what I do on this particular patient is a small incision, shave off the bump, then actually cut the bone and shift it over, and in this case, I hold it with a dissolvable pin. So you don't see any metal. You're going to see some uh, x-rays of metal in a bit. And make another little cut here called an Aiken osteotomy. And as you can see, that takes this foot and makes it nice and straight if you look at the edge of the foot over here. So this patient's happy. It's a good operation uh, for a mild to moderate foot. 
here's a patient I just did recently. And same idea, mild to moderate, shave off the bump, shift it over. You can see this one's not quite healed yet. So we can see a little clue in the bone here, another little cut here, and we've got a nice overall correction. So that's for a mild to moderate bunion. Works great. I've done over a thousand of these. So here's a different patient. And this is sort of my work. The first two are sort of the workhorse procedures. And the um, meaning that I do a lot of these from, from mild to moderate. The first one, this is the more severe. You can see again that the angle between these two bones is a little bit bigger. And I didn't think that in this particular case that I could get enough correction by doing the first procedure. It's a judgment call. Um, and part of what you cannot tell from x-rays is I have to examine the patient and feel how tight the tissues are, that sort of thing. So I wouldn't make a complete judgment off an x-ray. You have to examine the patient. And in this case, I like to cut the bone sort of at the base here rather than at the end, and then swing this part of it over and make these two bones nice and parallel. Forget the metal for just a second. So that you can see how nice and parallel these bones are. And I hold that with a plate and screw and get an excellent correction. So that's called a proximal osteotomy. Here's another patient with a pretty severe uh, bunion on this side. And this is before, and this is after. And you can see how the bone was cut right over here, swung it over, used the plate and screw to hold it, and got a very nice result from that. She also had a hammer toe there. You can see just a little trail of where I had a temporary pin at the same time. This. This bone, by the way, everybody always asks, what is that? And that's a, it's like a little kneecap underneath your big toe. We have two of them, all of us. And it just becomes very obvious um, when you see these x-rays, people think they've got something funny going there, but it's, it's normal. And it's actually that the first metatarsal is out of place. So that's normal. So you can get a great correction from that. Of course, the obvious question is what about the metal? And the answer is the metal is important to hold the bones in place until the bones have healed. And once the bones have healed, the metal no, no longer needs to be there. But the only way you're gonna get it out is to have a, another small procedure, which is much, much less recovery than a standard bunion. I mean, you can walk in and walk out basically. And probably one in 10, the metal may bother patients a little bit. So this patient is an example where I had corrected her on her right side several years ago, bunion hammer toes. And you can see this looks pretty perfectly straight foot, but that's the same person. And I had removed the uh, hardware on the right because it was bothering her a little bit. And then a few years later, she wanted to have her left foot addressed. So you can still see the metal is in place on the left. So, it's not a big deal to remove it. And it's a very powerful tool to allow me to um, achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve. Now, so that's basically two different kinds of procedures. So the third one is something called uh, a lapidus fusion. And what that is, is when these angles are really, really bad and the tissues are very tight, Sometimes we think it's a little bit beyond the capability or my capability of correcting the bone by cutting it over here. And so what we'll do is fuse the bone through this area over here. So this is before and this is after. And again, I took the angle from a V and you can see how nice and parallel this patient is. This is actually a male patient and I'm holding it with some plate and screws over there. But that's called a lapidus fusion. He was a famous surgeon in New York City uh, who came up with the procedure. And there are some surgeons who, I would say there's some surgeons who do this with a higher frequency than, than I do. I prefer not to do this if I don't have to, because this operation, 
you have to keep the patient off the foot for closer to a month, I would say, three or four weeks. Whereas this operation, you only have to be off your feet for uh, nine days. And the first one, you can actually put your weight on after five days. So as we move on, so each of those three procedures requires just a little bit more immobilization, takes a little bit longer. So I think a basic principle again, besides correcting angles, is do the least amount of surgery that you have to, to get the result that you need. And then this is another example where a patient is just very severely, uh, it's very, very severe bunion. It's an interesting patient because she has this foot that looks awful. You can actually see that the, um, if you look at this toe over here on the left, and we, subs and we did that side as well, you can see that this toe is completely rotated. So she's walking on the side of her toe, which makes it more difficult. So instead of doing one of the first three procedures, and perhaps I could have done a lapidus on this patient, I elected to fuse this joint over here. So put this, a plate and screw, and just weld these two bones together. And what we know from experience is that if we do that, uh, that will correct the alignment uh, for very severe bunions, a very powerful tool when you're addressing kind of a difficult foot like this. And in her case, I did the, the first side and then sometime later we, we fused the left side. Now the left side, um, I could have done a couple of thing, a couple of procedures there, um, but we elected after discussion that to proceed with this. Again, that metal usually stays in people for the rest of their lives. Uh, maybe one in 10 I have to take out because it's slightly irritating. And here's another patient. This particular patient has a bit more arthritis in the joint rather than deformities. Doesn't have so much of the V, but has arthritis. And sorry, let me just go back. And um, so when the joint is arthritic, we need to fuse it because if you make it straight, but you're leaving arthritis in the joint, the, you may continue to have pain. So there are several points. Uh, there are other ways to handle these problems. I would say there's some slight, there are some differences between uh, surgeons, um, but I think the basic principles are ones that uh, anybody who does this kind of surgery with frequency would agree on. So there's, there's a complexity to a bunion, you know, it, some of them are not that uh, straightforward and, and easy. Um, often there are other associated problems such as hematose, which is when the lesser toes are sort of up like that, or bunionettes or Morton's neuromas. There can often be other problems that should be addressed at the same time. I think that each patient has to, we have to assess the specific needs and goals of a patient. So you can't sort of cookie cut the problem. We need to um, talk to people and understand what it is that they need to do. Um, I think it's critical uh, that patients have an understanding of what their post-operative uh, course is gonna be. That's why I like to, I personally like to write it down um, and print it up for patients. I'm not writing it, I'm typing it. And because um, the old joke is, you know, if you're having someone do some work on your house and he says it's going to be two weeks and he's there six weeks later, you're not too happy with that uh, construction guy. And I think it's the same with surgeons is if we set unrealistic expectations, you're going to have an unhappy patient, even if you have a, a perfect result. I think whoever handles, if, if you have this sort of problem, whoever handles it, the surgeon should be adept at multiple different procedures because there's just no way you can correct every problem uh, one way. Um, and sometimes there is more than one right answer to a, a particular foot. Patient selection and careful pre-op planning and teaching is, is important. Again, that's all about understanding expectations. Uh, the old flight to California, you know, it's gonna be six hours. It's not gonna be one hour. Um, and I think 
the results in general are very good if the patient is informed and the surgeon adheres to, to these principles. So thank you for joining us. I am going to now see if I can figure out how to take some questions here. Al, maybe you can, uh, I know that I saw something come up. Oh, here we go, question and answer, six of them, okay. All right, first question. If you have severe bunions, the doozy kind, as you say, but no pain, is it worth fixing because it will eventually be painful? Um, I'm assuming answer live. I'm assuming you all can hear me. Al, text me if you can't, but... Um, they can hear you. Okay, great. So the answer, is, it, it's, that's a tough one. And I would say, for instance, one of those pa patients that I showed you with a very severe foot, if you met her, she's the loveliest lady, and she was exactly in that category. I'm a little... I like people to have a little bit of pain, to be honest, because then I know I'm really going to help them. Uh, but if you put someone through a long recovery, it's um, you're going to give them a bit of pain during the recovery, and it's got to be worth it. I think the patients who have very bad ones um, come in for a couple of reasons. One, shoe is just becomes impossible. Uh, the other is often what happens is you start getting problems with the other toes, like the second toe crosses over the big toe, or it, it gets crowded on the outside or you have an aroma. So patients will come and they said, I've had this bunion for years, but what's really driving me mad is the hammer toe. And that's sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back. So I think that's the common, one of the more common reasons. Um, okay, so another question is a good question. I said, if you, I said shift or swing it over, but why does it stay once you start walking on it? Because I'm actually changing the anatomy. So I'm cutting the bone and uh, let's see if I can go back to, So if, I, I hope you all can see this, this particular x-ray because uh, this is a very good example. So what I'm actually doing is cutting that bone over there. I have a few videos online of how I technically do it. And um, if you're interested, there's a, this plate is made by a company called Arthrex, A-R-T-H-R-E-X. And if you look my name on Arthrex for Bunyan, you'll, you'll see the technique. And so you actually, I'm actually cutting the bone and shifting it over. And, and that can be tricky sometimes. And this portion of the bone is the same as it was here. It's just that we're putting it in a new position. So you're actually getting the bone to heal in, um, in a new position. And that's the reason it shouldn't shift, shouldn't shift back. Now, anybody who does it, you gotta be a little humble when you do this stuff because anybody who does it, this sort of surgery, occasionally you can get a recurrence. And I always tell patients, no matter what it is, I'm going to be able to take care of it. But, and, but that would be uncommon. But it could happen. But usually if you stick to the, the basics, it will not shift over. What causes, next question, what causes bunions in the first place? Mostly it's genetic. Um, meaning your mother, your grandma, your grandpa uh, had some, had bunions and there's something about the anatomy, there's something about the genetic program that's telling this metatarsal to go a little off kilter. And then there's actually a muscle over here called the abductor hallucis that's yanking the big toe in a wrong direction. And it's the toe sort of sitting on the end and it's a little bit on like on a tightrope. And once it begins to go, it just keeps on, keeps on going. So mostly it's genetic. 
definitely can be exacerbated by shoe wear. Obviously, if you try to jam uh, your feet into something that they shouldn't fit into, that's going to exacerbate it. But I'd say the bad ones are mostly, um, mostly genetic. Uh, when fusing two bones, can a patient bend the foot, have a normal gait? Um, it's, this is one of the, um, and then there's another question, uh, can you, uh, another fusion question. Uh, it's actually remarkable. So when you fuse, it depends what you fuse, but when you fuse the big toe joint, um, you can wear a heel up to something like this. I actually have in my computer at work and I show patients examples of patients who've had a fusion and they, um, they're wearing heels like this and I keep it on file because everybody's worried about it. You can run, you can play tennis, you can play squash, um, but you're limited. There's a limit to high, how high you can go. And some, some patients are into uh, um, sort of Pilates, yoga, who are, or um, dance, and it's very important for them to keep that motion. It's not a good operation for them. But I would say for many patients, it's a terrific answer and uh, a, a great solution. Um, it doesn't affect the bend of the foot. And if, I, if someone was walking down the hall with a fused big toe, there's no way you would know they have anything going on in that foot. Um, do bunions called men cause, I've got a a lot of questions. I'm going to try to move through them. Um, sorry. Um, do bunions cause metatarsal pads? Um, the metatarsal pain. So what that person's asking about is, do you have pain under the metatarsal heads, like under these bones over here, which is when in common parlance, it would be the ball of your foot. Yes, it, yes, it can, because when the big toe is not functioning normally in this direction, it, it doesn't pick up its share of the load and it, and it can shift some of the forces towards the outside. Often these patients have hammer toes as well. And if patient has significant metatarsal pain, um, that there's a reason and that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I would say it's not, if you just have a bunion, you're probably not going to have too much metatarsal pain. One of the problems with some of the older bunion procedures was people would take out too much bone over here and end up shortening the toe, and that would cause a lot of pain on the outside. So there, there was a procedure called the Keller procedure, McBride procedures that did that sort of thing. We've gone away from that. Um, how long until one can walk on the foot. So it depends on the procedure. I would say my simplest procedure, which was the first one, it's around five to seven days. For the procedure with a plate, like you see in this patient, usually around nine days. Now, when I say walk, I mean in a little Velcro shoe or a small walking boot. And I keep you in a shoe or a Velcro shoe or walking boot because you know, we've cut the bone in your foot, we moved it over, it needs to heal for five to six weeks, four to six weeks, depending on the procedure. And at about five or six weeks, you get into a sneaker or a Merrill or a hiking shoe, that sort of thing. And for most patients, again, stationary bike elliptical around five or six weeks, running tennis around three months. The other thing I often say to patients is, you know, if you have a big hiking trip or you're going to uh, Europe, which no one's doing right now, uh, you give it about three months, three or four months, and I'll you'll be go you'll be good. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, Morton's neuroma. Can you address Morton's neuroma? Should it be removed? A Morton's neuroma is a is a pinched nerve, usually between the third and fourth toes, sometimes between the second and third. So it's probably seventy percent third and fourth, thirty uh, percent second and third. You really doesn't occur between one first and second or fourth and fifth. And there in my, there's all sorts of stuff about Morton's neuromas, very common problem. Most people who have neuromas don't need surgery. Uh, it, the typical description is, oh, I have pain in my foot. 
um, you're doing something, you have pain in your foot, your toes go numb, it's extremely uncomfortable, you take off your shoe, you rub your foot, you wait 20, 30 minutes later, it sort of goes away. It's a nerve that's pinched. The nerve has nothing to do with function. It's a pure sensory nerve. And in my book, there are four ways to treat it. A, you don't have to worry about it. If it's just annoying and you're worried something's going on and you can ignore it, it's okay. Uh, there are some simple orthotics that you can purchase that I tell patients about that you don't have to spend a lot of money for, uh, meaning 20 to $50 uh, that takes the pressure off the nerve and that can be helpful. Sometimes a shot of cortisone can be helpful. And last, if it's very uncomfortable, surgery where, you re where I remove the nerve and the trade is you have a little numbness between the toes, but the pain should be gone. So in the case of someone with a significant Morton's Roma and they have a bunion, I would definitely take the neuroma at the same time because it'd be a pity to go through the whole recovery and then the neuroma continues to bother you. Um, my sister and grandmother had terrible bunions, but I don't. Am I going to develop them? They're, I've seen 12-year-olds with bad bunions, and, I, and I, there's a whole issue of adolescent bunions, meaning you develop them in adolescence. So the chances are, if you haven't, I, I don't know how old you are based on, um, based on the question, but let's say you're 45, you're not going to get horrible bunions. No. Uh, is bunionectomy riskier for someone with osteoporosis? Um, not really. I mean, it's a little, you just got to be a little bit more careful with uh, an osteoporotic patient because when you put in the screws, the bone's not as solid, but we're used to dealing with that. Um, so I don't think it's, unless it's profound osteoporosis or osteopenia, um, it's, it's just normal, normal day, at, day at work for most of us. Uh, recovery period, recovery course, i.e. need for physical therapy after the uh, procedure. I tell patients a perfect foot is a straight, pain-free foot, full range of motion. So just like if you broke your arm, we put you in a cast for a month and say, don't move your wrist. And then as soon as you come out of the cast, move it. So <clears throat> it's the same with what I do. So for the first four or four to six weeks, we're sort of resting the foot, you're walking on it. And then I personally assess the patients at around four to six weeks, depending on the procedure. And between the patient and I, we can figure out whether you can just do the exercises on your own or whether you need to go to a physical therapist. And sometimes it's both. I have some videos on my website of the exercise. It's, it's not that complicated. You just got to get things going but some patients need help. I'd say it's about 50-50, but yes, everybody has to work on the exercises. Um, what is the recovery period? I think I, I ran through that. Uh, chances of bunions coming back should be low, should be uh, certainly less than 10%. I hope less, I hope a lower number than that. And then if it came back, um, there are, it's not likely to come back anywhere near as bad as they were initially, and there are ways to mitigate that, but it may require another procedure. I think anybody who tells you he's, he's never had a bunion come back and does bunion surgery is probably not being forthright. A friend had bunion surgery and she had a pin placed in the toe from the tip of the toe. It had to be pulled out later and said it was painful. Uh, is my choice of fixation always internal? Yes, mine is always internal. Uh, I think that's a bit old fashioned, to be honest. Um, um, so I don't think most people would probably do that anymore, but I don't do that. Um, I started to notice I'm getting a bunny on my left foot. Should I have it removed now before it gets worse? No, I like, it should bother you. Um, obviously it's always easier to do it when it's a little milder, easier for me, easier for you, but doesn't bother you too much, I, I would just wait on it because you can always fix it. Neuroma, I think I uh, answered that question. If you go on my website at onsmd.com, I have a little spiel also on neuromas, a little video if, you're, if you happen to be interested in that. Um, when you say cutting the bone, is it like a broken bone that has to be reset? Yes, it is. We call that, in orthopedics, we call those this an osteotomy which means oste osteo is bone 
and osteotomy means cut it. So it, that's a common um, reconstructive situation for any orthopedist. I happen to be a foot and ankle person. So when you cut a bone and you, you move it over, um, that's called an osteotomy. And when you're correcting deformity, um, you, it's, it's not like a broken bone because that's not controlled. It's, not, it's a very controlled, if you watch the videos and so forth, you'll see it should be a very, very controlled uh, situation and um, not random like a, like a broken bone. Do you know beforehand which procedure you'll do? I always know beforehand what I'm gonna do um, because um, sometimes if, for instance, if you're sitting in front of me, I can say we could do it this way, we could do it that way. And I have to, we sort of together decide what may be the best procedure, but I don't remember ever switching in, in, um, in mid course. Um, so yes, I know. Um, are there toe appliances that can help alleviate pain? Well, if you go online, you're gonna certainly find a lot of stuff out there that someone's trying to sell you. There's no data to support that they change the course, meaning there's no data to support that you can take a crooked toe and make it straight like crooked teeth. Um, but some patients find that some of these appliances give them a bit of uh, relief of discomfort. Um, and that's really what it's all about. It's about being comfortable. Um, same question. I have no pain, but my mother, who's 35 years older than I am, does have pain. She's literally walking on her toes and has trouble wearing most shoes. She's now in her 90s and cannot have surgery. Should I get it corrected now? So your mom's in her 90s and you're not. Uh, you're 35 years younger. I certainly have patients. Um, I've had patients. I've operated in patients in the 90s. Uh, I, when I started my career, who thought you'd be doing elective surgery in the 90s? But there are a lot of great 90-year-olds around. Uh, and I, but I do think that there's a lot of patients who wish they'd done it a little bit uh, earlier. My own grandmother had a terrible foot years ago, long before I was doing this. And that was the one big problem she had. So it's a judgment call. That's a judgment call. Um, are there non-surgical remedies for non-painful bunions when the other toes begin rubbing and folding over? Um, I think that answer, that's the same answer is that there's lots of stuff out there. If you go online and you look for all sorts of padding and there are, there are things that patients can do. One of, the, one of the other questions that hasn't been asked incidentally is what's the role for orthotics? And my general answer on that is if your foot's very um, flat, it'll put more pressure on the bunion. So sometimes a bit of an arch support will help. I usually tell people don't spend a ton of money on that. And generally some over-the-counter orthotics, there's a lot of good brands out there that um, are good over-the-counter orthotics and that can sometimes make people more comfortable. And you know that um, sort of, uh, just from common sense, because you know a good sneaker or a shoe or maybe a clog with an arch support is, is more comfortable. Uh, is it true that if you have a length difference in leg, leg length, the foot on the longer leg is prone to develop a bunion? Uh, I'm not aware of that. If, if that's true, I'm not aware of that. And most people, it's pretty unusual, but patients who have significant leg length discrepancies can have all sorts of other issues. Um, can a bunion be corrected by wearing a brace or wearing arches in your shoes? So we answered that. Um, generally, how soon can you drive if it's your right foot? So I usually, generally, it's three or four weeks. That's, that's the answer. And that, of course, is the rate limiting step for many, many patients. I usually tell patients, listen, the shoe that I'm going to give you after 10 days, if I gave it to you before surgery, you'd be able to drive home, no problem. So it's just when you're comfortable and safe. Um, and so three to four weeks is the answer. For more mild bunions, can you speak to forms of self-care we can try first? Devices, exercises. Um, 
One, one thing that's interesting is there are patients who have the patients who have the best control of their toes. Most of us don't have terrific control of our toes because we just don't. But patients who do a lot of yoga exercises uh, can learn to use their toes and can take some of the pressure off. So I have seen that in some patients. So th th that would be my advice. Um, will hammer toes that are fixed with a bunion surgery return? Should not. Hammer toes are in, uh, come in all different sizes and shapes and are actually, I often tell people, um, hammer toes are relatively annoying to fix for the patient and the doctor because it's just this little toe and it would seem to be super, super easy and simple, but they can be sometimes quite tricky. Um, so the short answer is it shouldn't recur, but sometimes there are some minor issues. And they, if there were, you have to address it. Now think about it. If let's say you have a bunion, a hammer toe and two or three hammer toes, and everybody has a hammer toe has a problem at this part of their foot where the metatarsal heads are. So Technically, I'm doing about six or seven operations on one foot. So it's hard to be perfect with everything. We try to be, but sometimes there could be a, a slight issue. So I think the more you've got wrong, you've got to reasonably think, well, hey, there's a chance he might have to fine tune something down the road. And uh, I let people know that. I'm not expecting to do that, but it's possible. Does posture contribute to foot problems, including bunions? Uh, I don't think so, no. But sometimes patients do have other problems with their foot. For instance, they one thing we see, there's a diagnosis called a posterior tibial tendon tear where you lose, where your arch suddenly collapses from a tendon problem. And if your arches or your ankle collapse, it definitely collapses the whole foot and can exacerbate the bunion issue. Um, what pre-op, boy, these questions are great. What pre-op, routines, procedures, criteria are required be during, uh, before doing the surgery. So if you're in, we follow, we have excellent anesthesia colleagues that we work with and we follow national guidelines. And the guidelines are that if you're a healthy person, uh, let's say to have a cutoff 65, if you're a healthy person under 65, you really don't need any preoperative uh, blood work, X, uh, you don't need a chest X-ray, you don't need an EKG. Um, of course, these days, everybody needs a COVID test before surgery, and we'll see if we eventually drop that for vaccinated patients. But right now, every patient who has surgery has a COVID test. Uh, if you have some what's called comorbidities, meaning you've got a, some medical issues, then uh, then we need your medical doctor to sign off and maybe we need a little bit of blood work. For instance, if you have some hypertension and you're on a diuretic, we'd want to do a little bit more for you than someone who has none of that. But the average healthy person doesn't really need anything much. And those are not my standards, those are in national standards. Uh, do you know if certain foot problems such as bunions were an issue with early people, skeletons found with this type of condition? Uh, I do not know that. And I'm, I love that sort of stuff. I should know it, um, not to my knowledge. My right leg is a quarter inch shorter than the left. Bunion started in right foot first and left after that. Left one is worse shape than right. Um, yeah. It, as I said, every patient is, uh, has their own particular situation and you've got to assess each patient accordingly. Um, I've seen a different foot and ankle doctor at ONS to look at my foot. Do all of you perform the same procedures and where do you perform the surgeries? In our case, um, we, yes, th there is consistency. Uh, I'm the more senior guy here. So Mark Yakovonis, who's a terrifically trained guy up at uh, Mass General in Harvard and at BU. And I think that we try to be consistent between the two of us. So you might have some slight um, variation, but generally, yes. And the, the surgery is done on an outpatient basis, meaning it's three or four hours, and we either do it um, at 
an ONS surgical facility or at the Greenwich Hospital outpatient surgical facility. So those would be the two places. It would be rare to, um, I wouldn't keep anyone overnight unless it was something really strange. One question I didn't get, which sometimes I get is, uh, what about doing both at once? I don't like doing that um, because it's hard on the patient and, um, and how do you not put weight on it? How do you get up and down stairs? Um, occasionally, I would say the patient that I would do it on is a 18 year old young lady who weighs a hundred pound and pounds and her dad can carry her up and down stairs and her mom and someone can serve her food uh, for the 10 days that she's not supposed to put weight on it. But for most people, that's not really a reality. And so if you, if you think, okay, how long am I gonna be out from, let's say you're a tennis player, you love tennis. Um, you're gonna be out for three months before you're playing tennis hard. So I'll often do foot one uh, here, and then the second foot about four weeks after the first foot. That way we compress the timeline so you get everything done in a relatively short period of time. There are some people who will do bilaterals. I used to earlier in my career, but it's uh, generally not, uh, not advisable, I would say. And let's see, I think I might've come up. Oh, no. My daughter's 31 and her do big toe falls behind the second toe. Should she have surgery now in her 30s? She lives in New Zealand. <laughs> do I have a good surgeon there? No, but I love New Zealand. So maybe I'll go over there and do it. Um, she, she's got to decide how much it bothers her. Uh, in general, orthopedic surgeons in New Zealand, Australia are very good, very well trained. So there should be someone who could handle it over there. The, again, the um, the indication is subjective at the in the end. Um, is it true that a scooter is given to assist in moving around after surgery? Are crutches used or walking boots? So remember the um, remember the First, depending on, on your situation, the first week or two or three, uh, you're not putting weight on it. The average person um, has a lot of trouble with crutches, I would say. If, you, if you're young, you know, if, in, if you're 18, you can use crutches, no problem. If you're 60 and you used crutches when you were younger, you can probably use crutches. But if you don't have the muscle memory, it's like trying to learn to ride a bike, you're probably not going to be too good on it. So those patients, I generally recommend a walker because one thing we don't need is a fall. And if you're a little woozy and you're on crutches, it's exceedingly difficult to use. So I don't love crutches and I discourage them except for patients who are quite adept. And we do, I do love the scooters. It's something called a turning leg caddy. And um, usually you rent them if you need, for patients who need it for a longer period of time, which is not really the bunion patients mostly. Um, I generally recommend you buy them because you can buy them online for about $110, $120, but, or you can rent them for $20, $25 a week. And they have, they make a dramatic difference for most patients. For most people, the biggest single problem is what's your house like? Do you have stairs? All of that. Um, where am I? My, I generally see patients in our mainly in our Greenwich office, but also in our Harrison office. Um, I had a podiatrist operate 30 years ago when I was young, all came back worse in order. Can this be corrected? Yeah, almost everything can be corrected. Some things are not correctable. Um, usually if there was a lot of bone taken out, that becomes quite challenging. How do you do that? And then, um, also, again, patients have had prior surgery. It's critical that we both understand what we're trying to what we're trying to do. Okay, I think we're good. Should we sign out, Al? You're all done. Sure. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good dinner. <laughs>